You mentioned in your presentation that history often repeats itself, but right? debt crises lead to a market crisis, leads to a currency in crisis and inflation, mm -hmm. leads to social unrest, extreme political control yeah. by either the left or the right. Yeah. That's happened throughout history. Yeah. Is it happening this time? We see opportunists everywhere. This is the, we see political opportunists. It's the prostitution of our government at the expense of the many for the benefit of the few. That was said in the 1850s, but look at the Federal Reserve. It created the biggest asset bubble in history since 2008. 90% of the benefit goes to the top 10%. That includes me. So that is a wealth inequality, which is direct related to Fed policy in the very existence of the central bank. So I think it does have massive impact on me as a citizen and as an investor. It leads to social unrest. And then you see more control. Many economists are forecasting a soft landing, but our next guest thinks that things could be a little bit worse. He is Matt Pippenberg. He is the partner of Von Greyer's AG, and we're speaking at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. Welcome to the show, Matt. I've spoken with you offline just now. You were telling us about how a hard landing could be incoming. We spoke a few months ago on my show virtually. And uh, just to follow up on the themes of our last discussion, Things aren't looking great according to you. I'm just gonna push, before I let you speak, I'm just gonna push back on some data here. <laughs> Consumer sentiment is up, unemployment rate is still low, uh, inflation rate's coming down, the stock market's up at an all-time high. Why do you think we're getting a hard landing? Well, again, there's a, there's a massive divorce between an economy and a market. Those are different sure. things, but yet, at the same time, they're very important. Yeah. The market in a Pavlovian way, to me, symptomatic of not a true capitalistic supply and demand driven stock market, but a centralized Fed driven stock market. So to me, it's very Pavlovian when the, when the Fed is either hawkish or dovish, the market is either bearish or bullish in a sense. And that's not an oversimplification. And uh, in a lot of ways, you know, Powell has projected these cuts, which we can discuss in more detail in 2024. They haven't even actually happened yet. They're just projected, but and I think they will happen for a number of reasons. But just the, I don't want to say easing because it's not QE, it's, it's reducing pressure on rates. Already the market has leapt on that. That's a positive bullish tailwind on what is effectively a more dovish pivot from Powell. It's not QE, but it's a rate change. We've gone from a, a pause to now a projected pivot and a cut, and the markets are giddy over that. And uh, they're pricing in so many cuts, which we can talk about how realistic that is. But to me, that's not a sign of a strong economy. That's a sign of a dovish Fed, and therefore a market following that carrot, going up on that news. The stuff we spoke about, the indicators we spoke about last time haven't changed in terms of what is a hard landing versus a soft landing. I think it's, again, an example of words, sentiment, replacing math and facts. Um, again, repeat, the, the conference were leading indicators was in bearish territory, was in recessionary territory last December when it broke through that threshold. When you have a money, M2 money supply go down by 4%, that's recessionary always in the past. Um, when you have really Powell pivoting on rates before we hit target 2% inflation, it's because Powell knows what we in the bond market already know, that the bond market in general, and the sovereign bond market in particular, can't handle positive 2% real rates. It can't. So it, it's important for him to bring rates down Inflation hasn't been quote unquote defeated yet. And the deflation or deflationary sentiment we're seeing now is just a part of a cycle that's going to end up being ultimately more inflationary in my mind. So again, those are kind of Wall Street indicators, yield curve. Still, you get more yield on the two year than the 10 year. We still have an inverted yield curve, not massive, but still inverted. We've got an M2 money supply in the last many months that suggested a recession. We've got the conference world indicators. We have the Main Street indicators, the layoffs. We've got the bankruptcies. Again, those aren't me just being bearish to be bearish. They're not reflected in the stock market rising on a dovish pivot discussion. But those things are clearly Main Street and Wall Street indicators. And, I, and again, I repeat because it's important. It's a clear indicator of sentiment on Main Street. It's certainly in the U.S., where I'm from in the state of Virginia, there's a town called Farmville, and there's a, a guitar player named Oliver Anthony. I bring it up over and over again because he has over a million, 100 million hits in a period of three months because his song is an anthem to what the real economy feels. And so, yes, stock market is higher on dovish news and dovish sentiment. Again, led by seven, fantastic seven, 30% of the market cap. Uh, to me, that's not a rising, strong, robust economy. Yes, inflation is down because we've had a demand destruction through Powell's higher for longer policy, which has been destructive by just about everything but the U.S. dollar. And still the DXY is at 103. It was at 112 in July of 2022 and rates were up. It's coming down because rates are coming down. 
but or projected to come down. But these these indicators on Wall Street and Main Street are divorced from the S&P right now. And that S&P is divorced from free cash flow and balance sheets. It's driven by whether the Fed is hawkish or dovish. And to me, nothing's new under the sun there. And the question is, how sustainable is that? I, a trader I talk to regularly told me that, look, you can't trade the CPI. You can't trade the GDP numbers. Ultimately, right. what does this hard landing mean for the markets? That's, you know, Bob Moriarty, great guy. I love a lot of his thinking. Bob Moriarty says, I trade sentiment. Even if it's stupid sentiment, smart sentiment, sentiment. Why, why fight sentiment? And sentiment is driven by Fed policy. We hang on every word of Powell. We translate Powell. We translate the FOMC. We, we look at that to determine whether they're going to be supportive, whether it's going to be headwinds or tailwinds. But you're right. CPI, yield spreads, conversations about conference board lead indicators, threshold numbers, all these things are very academic in Wall Street. But if the market is positive for whatever reason, whether it's because they believe in Santa Claus, or they believe low rates are going to save them. Well, yes, you're right. Trade the sentiment. That's like a good CTA fund would trade the trend. The trend is your friend. Whether the trend makes sense is a good point. It doesn't matter if that's the trend. In another discussion, we can talk about how Santa Claus affects the real economy and the markets. But for now, let's talk about this hard landing some more. What does this look like for the real economy? When you say hard landing, just for the layman watching, what does that mean? Well, again, it means massive layoffs, 400 bankruptcies, with a lot of jobs lost in those bankruptcies, record-breaking bankruptcies. You know, it also means, you know, jobs report. I've always said, and it's not meant to just be bearish to be bearish, because I'm actually bullish on the S&P when I see a, a dovish yeah. Fed. So I'm not just being bearish on the, on the S&P. I'm actually bullish on the S&P. I've said so publicly for now. Well, again, when the Fed says we've got 200 new jobs created this month, that's bullish news. That's more proof that our war against inflation is kind of coming in. We've hit terminal rates. Things are going to be fine. Now we're on the recovery. We've defeated inflation. It's all rosy from here. Well, that ignores the 1.5 million jobs that are just gone. Under 700,000 new part-time jobs, there's still a massive delta between jobs that are gone, jobs that are now part-time, and newly created jobs. So how the BLS stovepipes manipulates to its advantage for the narrative on employment. It's the same thing they do with inflation, which again, I think we talked about last time, your conversation with John Williams at Shadow Stats and how they look at real inflation. This is not a conspiracy theory of a quack in his mother's basement that come up with reasons did not trust anything. Sure. But the CPI inflation scale is not the right inflation scale. That said, there's no doubt that ripping rates from the zero bound to five and three quarters is going to be disinflationary. It's going to sack the middle class. It's going to lead to more bankruptcies. And yes, inflation will come down, but it's a pyrrhic victory. And just to provide context for the audience, because you referenced John Williams' work on shadow stats. So what he did was he, he calculated the current CPI based on the calculation that the BLS used to use before 1981, right. I believe. Right. They made a revision to their methodology. Yep. And you're right. It, According to that old methodology, the number is much higher. Now, in your presentation earlier at the VRIC, you mentioned several problems internally in the U.S., including rising wealth inequality, the devaluing currency, uh, weak political leadership. Out of all the things that you mentioned in your presentation, what do you think are the biggest problems right now that the U.S. is facing? Well, again, the biggest problem kind of gets amorphous and beyond yield spreads and S&P numbers yeah. and projected rate cuts. Uh, it's something I've said and I've pounded my fist on for years, and it's really becoming... The facts aren't really changing, so my opinion isn't changing. The facts are just getting worse, so my opinion is getting stronger. And that, and that template I talked about here on the panel this morning is, look, and again, you can go out throughout history, and I'll say it again and again until it sinks in, when a country, whether it's a democracy, whether it's a monarchy, whether it's pick your poison, whatever kind of regime it is, throughout history going back centuries to the 1990s in Yugoslavia, whenever you're deeply over your skis in debt, when a country's debt-soaked, there's always a market crisis that follows, which is followed by a currency crisis, which is followed by an inflation crisis, which is then followed by a political reaction of extreme control, either from the left or the right. Pick a map, pick a time in the calendar, pick a compass. We see that template over and over. So what concerns me more than just debates on the DXY or debates on inflation versus deflation or an S&P rising or falling, which are all important, what concerns me the most about America is this rise of centralization, not just in the central bank or the discussions on CBDC. It's the weaponization of the DOJ, DOJ, regardless of your partisan politics. That's a bad sign. It's the misuse of the 14th Amendment. I went to law school. The 14th Amendment, Section 3, is not self-actualizing. There are things that we're seeing. The weaponization of the media, the fifth estate, the fourth estate, whatever that is. When Bezos owns the, wall Street, or the Washington Post and Murdoch owns the Wall Street Journal. It's not a conspiracy theory. I'm not saying it's all bad, but we don't have a free press. We don't have an objective justice system. And this is not a pro-Trump thing to say. I could be 
I can come up with a million reasons why people don't like Trump and understand it. Or same thing with Biden. It's not partisan. It's a weaponization of what was supposed to be justice. It's a weaponization of supply and demand at the Fed. It's a weaponization of Facebook and Google. It was an interesting thing, you know, you've got executives, former executives of Google say, we've got 20,000 employees who get paid $200,000 to $500,000 a year just to find ways to manipulate the algorithm so that how information is spread. You've got Facebook talking to different intel agencies to see what is news and what is true news. That's not a decision for Facebook and the intel agencies to make. That's an infringement on free speech, in my opinion. So you've got censorship. You've got weaponization of our legal system. You've got a clear abuse of power at the DOJ. You've got 51 members of our national intelligence agency saying that the Hunter laptop theory was a Russian hoax. All these things are quantifiably, empirically, objectively not true. There's no accountability for that. We haven't even gone into the highly debatable policies in the Ukraine or the highly debatable policies on COVID, which is just seems to be forgotten and ignored when so much of what people were concerned about has been proven to be true. It was an overuse of power. And again, those are all debatable points. What we all agree on is that there is more and more centralization. That is particularly clear with the central bank having so much control over the market forces. And, when you uh, say that you're concerned about these things, are you expressing concern from the perspective of a citizen or an investor? Both, both, but ultimately as a citizen. Because right now as an investor, and I'm simplifying again, and I do come obviously from bias and right now in wealth preservation on precious metals. But before that, I ran a hedge fund during the dot-com bubble. I won a lottery ticket on a dot-com stock on a pre-IPO. I love speculation. I love crazy capitalistic markets. What I don't like right now is how more and more of these market forces are being determined by what the Fed turns you know, up thumb or down thumb. And that to me is, as an investor, concerns me. I see uh, almost to the point where you could literally make the argument that they will and can nationalize the S&P in a sense, always buy the dip, always support it with rate policies or balance sheet policies. And we have what is effectively a national 401k. That can be done theoretically, as MMT would say. You can keep supporting these S&P markets, but you'll do so at the expense of the currency because the only way to support this is with extreme liquidity. And extreme liquidity, synthetic, is inherently inflationary in my opinion. In your presentation, that history often repeats itself. Uh, let me see if I get this right. Debt crises lead to a market crisis, leads to a currency crisis and inflation, mm -hmm. leads to social unrest, extreme political control yeah. by either the left or the right. Yeah. That's happened throughout history. Yeah. Is it happening this time? We see opportunists everywhere. This is the, we see political opportunists. This is something Hemingway talked about. This is something Von Mises talked about. This is something Andrew Jackson talked about when he was talking particularly about the idea of a national central bank, which goes against our constitution, in my opinion. But he said it's the, it's the prostitution of our government at the expense of the many for the benefit of the few. That was said in the 1850s, but look at the Federal Reserve. It created the biggest asset bubble in history since 2008. 90% of the benefit goes to the top 10%. That includes me. So that is a wealth inequality, which is a direct relate to Fed policy in the very existence of the central bank. So I think it does have massive impact on me as a citizen and as an investor. It leads to social unrest. And then you see more control, whether that's I think opportunists like Klaus Schwab, or whether it's controlled centers like central banks in the ECB or in the US Fed in particular, it's, it's just more and more versions of centralization. That is not free market price discovery. That is not free, and to my other arguments, that's not free press, that's not free markets, that's not free speech. Those are the hallmarks of everything I learned in a very good law school, in a very good undergrad school, the, politicals, the politicization of the law, the weaponization of these, these, these forces that are supposed to be free and natural. I don't think it's an exaggeration, not in my mother's basement somewhere doing Google searches to become a conspiracy theory. It's a very, I think, evidence-based trends we're seeing that are a little more amorphous than just, will the stock market go up and down this year? I think the world is starting to get concerned about the control state that we live in. What, what can the U.S. do, or what should the U.S. do, both private and public sector, to get back on the straight and narrow, have some political stability, have some economic and social stability? Well, again, these are Pollyannish answers when you've destroyed trust. In a sense, trust is dying. Every conversation I have, whether it's in Canada, whether it's in France, whether it's in Germany, whether it's in Switzerland, the conversation is more and more about I've lost trust in government X or party Y because of the dishonesty, the lack of accountability, the lack of follow up on so many policy areas, whether it's central bank policy, whether it's foreign policy in the Ukraine. It's not even that they have to agree with them or disagree, but there's no open debate on these things. They distrust a media that is completely corporatized. And again, the definition, and again, it's a sensational term, but the definition of a fascist state is when you have the perfect marriage of corporations and government. And what we see right now is not conspiracy quack, it's open and obvious. Uh, there was a great comment made that 
the amount of employees at Google just working on algorithms, the power of Google, the power of Facebook, the power of Amazon. Amazon, by the way, violates everything I learned in law school about the Sherman Act or the Clayton Act on antitrust laws. That's like a robber baron type of power that Bezos has. And then and and, and taking that from Amazon to the, Wall, to the Washington Post, these things violate central principles of antitrust and, and basically robber baron powers. And that does not make me anti-capitalist. But all these things are happening where people are losing trust in their authority, losing trust in the media, losing trust in natural markets, they're losing trust in policy, foreign, domestic, and in their leadership. And so we're seeing massive swings. And that's the, the Javier Malay phenomenon we're seeing. It's, it's getting public kind of popular support. I'm not saying I'm for or against it, but he's talking like Von Mises. I'm going to destroy the bureaucracy. I'm going to destroy the Peronism. I'm going to destroy this functionary state where everyone's just working for the government, helping them to centralize power at the expense of the masses. I'm not a revolutionary. I think the way to solve this is to have more transparency, more, account about, uh, more accountability. You can't get transparency or accountability when you're not getting the truth, whether that's about safe and effective or that's about whether this war makes sense or not, or who's making the decisions. And again, I'm not pro-Trump, I'm not. But we do need to ask who's making decisions in the Ukraine, our foreign policy or on NATO. Is it Biden? Really, is it Biden? Was it Biden's decision um, to weaponize the US dollar or was it somebody else's? What Biden, do you mean US dollar? well, when we froze the FX reserves of a major power like Russia, this is something John Maynard Keynes said you should never do. This is something Barack Obama, his former boss said you should never do. Do not weaponize the US dollar. No, especially against a major country. But, but, like but why not? Because you lose trust in that world. Wouldn't it be person. easier to weaponize a dollar? Well, not easier, but in an ideal world, better to weaponize a dollar than weaponize aircraft carriers. I'm just throwing mm -hmm. that out there. But eventually one dollar leads to the other. Because right. when you weaponize what was supposed to be a neutral reserve asset, right. friends and enemies alike of the US, the home of that reserve currency, sure. raise their eyebrows in distrust mm -hmm. and say, like Saudi Arabia, you're seeing that now. You're seeing pseudo friends of the U.S. pulling away, not overnight, not tomorrow, slowly but surely, death by a thousand cuts, away from trust in the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury because we've weaponized what was supposed to be neutral. You can do that with Venezuela and Iran. You can't do that with China or Russia or other large countries. And that's why larger countries are saying, we've accepted your, imp we've imported your inflation since 1971. We know you're the biggest you know, guy in the block. But now you've gone too far. And that is why we're having the theme, not the end result of de-dollarization, rising slowly and steadily. That's why when Biden, after calling the crown prince of Saudi Arabia a pariah state, he got a fist pump while Xi got a handshake. Saudi Arabia now is doing more deals with China than it does with Europe and America combined. Again, it doesn't mean Saudi, which is pegged to the US dollar, is going to leave the petrodollar or leave the dollar. But the direction it's going is clear and convincing to me. And it's something we should be concerned about because if that petrodollar loses any of its strength, then the dollar loses its strength because the world is slowly turning away from the dollar. Again, 80% of trade settlements is U.S. dollars, 70% of global GDP measured in, in the U.S. dollar. There is no doubt that the U.S. dollar is still supreme, but its hegemony is irrevocably lost because its trust is irrevocably lost. Once they weaponize the world reserve currency against Russia, whether you were in favor of Putin or Zelensky is irrelevant, once you weaponize the U.S. dollar, trust in that neutral currency ended overnight, and it was going to be irrevocable. You've so studied trust, the. Sorry, please. I'm just saying, this goes to trust across the board. Whether it's trust in your media, trust in your government, trust in your dollar, or trust in your foreign policy, it all comes back to this politicization, this weaponization, and people are losing trust. You've studied the petrodollar, the history of the petrodollar, and you're commenting offline to me about the transition of the status of the petrodollar from yep. what it was to what it will become. Yep. What is it going to become, Matthew? It's a very important topic and what I'm certainly not going to predict or, or it's a mug's game to say, well, the petrodollar's days are over because if that were true, that would be devastating to the U.S. dollar. It would be extremely good for gold. And as bullish as I am about gold, I don't see the petrodollar ending anytime soon. But think about certain implications right now. You have to understand, it wasn't a foregone conclusion when Nixon got off the gold standard. You know, when he took away that chaperone, now the U.S. president, the White House, could print as much money as they wanted without having to back it by a certain storage of gold. That created a massive boon for every president's sense to monetize or spend to get reelected with money printed out of thin air. 
But at the same time that they decoupled from gold, Kissinger was running around the OPEC countries trying to convince them, please make sure that oil is bought in U.S. dollars. We need demand for that U.S. dollar because we don't have gold anymore to give it credibility. But if oil can be bought in gold, that's great. So what Kissinger was trying to convince them to do that, Volcker was raising interest rates by 15 percent, 18 percent to make the U.S. dollar look sexy, to make the U.S. Treasury look credible. OPEC said, OK, fine. Now we have a petrodollar. That was 50 plus years ago. Well, today, in 2024, the U.S. dollar isn't what it used to be in 1971 or 73, and the U.S. Treasury isn't as loved. And we can't. Volcker could raise interest rates by 15 percent to make that U.S. Treasury and dollar more attractive. Powell cannot, because unlike 1973, we have 34 trillion in public debt and counting. We have the Congressional Budget Office right now printing another 20 trillion in IOUs in the next 10 years. So we do not have the 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 the, the, the luck or the good fortune that Volcker did to raise rates to make our U.S. Treasury attractive. And so we're seeing OPEC looking differently. Again, the handshake with Xi and the fist pump with Biden. At the same time, since 2014, and this is not a gold bull conspiracy theory, central banks since 2014, net sellers of U.S. Treasury, net buyers of, of physical gold. These are clear and convincing signs of a slow but steady shift away from the U.S. dollar, which was accelerated when we weaponized that against Putin. How do the BRICS countries pose ev even a minor threat to the U.S. economically speaking? I mean, China has internal economic yeah, problems. Absolutely. Russia, I don't have to remind you, has absolutely. problems. Most of India lives in poverty. Yes, absolutely. Why, why, is, this a, why is this an issue, Matthew? And, and this is where I agree entirely with Brent Johnson and Daniel Martino and others. It's not as if another currency is about to replace the U.S. dollar yeah. ever or anytime soon. And when I talk about a multipolar, a multi-currency world, it's also multi-dysfunctional. That's not necessarily a good thing. The U.S. is weak, but so is China, so is India, so is the rest of the world, so is most of the emerging market. It's a global problem. So the U.S. is still the best horse in the glue factory or the best patient in the ICU, which gives us this debate about DXY, which is still absolutely the U.S. dollar. For liquidity, nothing better. For preservation, gold, nothing better. And the U.S. dollar is relatively stronger, although the Swiss franc's even better. But I'm saying it's an irrelevant point. I don't think the DXY ever goes to 140 again. But it doesn't matter if the DXY or the dollar is stronger. Its inherent purchasing power is weaker. No one trusts it. And if the U.S. is going to issue another 20 trillion, even without a recession in the next 10 years, who's going to buy that IOU? Nobody enough there's not enough natural demand. That means the Fed will have to buy that IOU, that U.S. Treasury with printed money. That's fiscal dominance. That's ultimately highly inflationary. That's the end game. These are long-term mega trends that we're discussing. Investors might wonder, what are the immediate investment implications of these trends? Well, the immediate investigations is risk on right now because the Fed is just announced or projected they're going to I just want to make sure I hear you right. It risk on, not risk, risk on. off. Risk on. Okay. For the S&P, for equities, okay. equities love lower rates. Right. Think about it. It's not. Now, let's be clear. After the great, the regional banking crisis, the beginning of 2023, we called the BTFP program by the frickin' put, uh, by the frickin' pivot. Everyone thought Powell would pivot in early 2023. The markets projected it, I projected it. They would cut rates after that crisis in the bond market because the regional bank crisis of 2023 was a bond crisis, not a banking crisis. It just was. And now, I do think though, this time the market is right, there's going to be a rate cut. I don't think there'll be seven or eight. And here's the reason why. We have $740 billion worth of bonds that have to be repriced on the S&P. S&P names that have to reprice their debt in 2024. In 2025, another 1.2 trillion in corporate bonds have to be repriced. They need to bring those rates down now before those bonds roll over. When they roll over, they have to be repriced at the higher for longer policy. That would have been devastating. So for one thing, Powell had to cut rates to save the S&P, some of those names, because their debt was rolling over. Uncle Sam's debt over the next 36 months, there's over 30 trillion in US treasuries that were gonna have to be repriced. You need a lower rate to do that because Uncle Sam can't afford higher rates. So Powell has no choice. He has to bring rates down. He has to give some support to the, uh, give some support to, to borrowers basically or, or issuers of debt. Because the simple fact is if rates stay too high for too long, it kills everything but the US dollar. And so it's time to make a pivot. I don't think we'll see seven or eight rate cuts. I could be wrong, but we will have to see some. And I think there's just so much pressure on all these other markets from real estate to stocks to bonds, they can't handle 2% positive real rates. They can't stand higher rates. So Powell has thrown in the towel long before he hit target 2% inflation because the bond market can't handle his higher for longer policy. So to your question, I'm bullish for now on even the projection of rate cuts. I'm bullish for now on Powell being accommodative to the S&P. 
short of an extrinsic event or a headline. I, I joke cryptically, and this is cryptic, you could have a nuclear bomb go off in Cleveland and the markets could still go up as long as the Fed is accommodated, as long as the Fed is supported. Because that's how divorced natural market forces are from reality. And because the Fed is, sadly, the market. And, and you can go back at Q3 of 2022, Q1 of 2023, you can find scenarios where when rates got too high, the bond markets just destroyed themselves. It was crazy. The volatility was crazy. They couldn't stand higher rates. And so the Fed will have to accommodate the system. It has to accommodate the bond market as the bond market also affects the stock market. It affects the pension market. It affects the currency market. Throughout history, this is the key issue. You always save the system, bonds, at the expense of the currency, always without exception. So the U.S. dollar will be sacrificed at the end to save the U.S. Treasury and to save the U.S. system. And so who will be hurt the most? Main, Main Street citizens whose cost of living goes up. You can inflate the S&P too and get higher returns, but you're going to be measuring those returns on the dollar that has less and less purchasing power. What does all this mean for gold? It's extremely good for gold because, yeah, the power will have to be accommodated. You will have to bring rates down. That means, you know, the dollar is going to get weaker inherently. But gold is, you know, gold has so many reasons that it's disconnecting from its standard pro and con cases or bull and bear cases. It doesn't really matter whether rates are high or low, whether the dollar is weak or strong, whether they're positive or negative, or whether there's inflation or deflation. Gold has been reaching all-time highs in circumstances where typical headwinds for gold. And the reason gold is doing well is it goes back to that amorphous topic I've said at the beginning, trust. Trust is in everything is disappearing. It is a metric that the rest of the world doesn't trust the U.S. IOU and the U.S. dollar like it did in my father's age or my grandfather's age. This is not the U.S. dollar of Bretton Woods 1944. This is not the U.S. IOU of pre-1971 America. That is not me trying to be anti-patriotic or pro-gold. as math and history. And it's just the truth. It's, it's playing out everywhere I travel. It's the same story. Same story. All right, Matt. I hear ACDC playing us off, so I think yeah. that's our cue to leave. Here we go. Uh, what, uh, where can we follow your work? Well, again, we're always still at goldswitzerland.com, although you can also find us at vongreyers.gold right. because we've changed the name in honor of our founder, right. Egon von Greyers, who's still very much, obviously, the iconic figure. But we just wanted our company to represent his values and, and outlook, which, you know, he's still very much at the, head of our, at the head of our boat, and we're thrilled to have him as the name of our company now. Matthew, an absolute pleasure to meet you in person finally. Yeah, we're big fans of your work. Thank, Thank you, you for coming on the show. Enjoyed it. Love it. Thank you for watching our show, and don't forget to follow Matthew Pippenberg in the links down below.